does not fall under the Data Privacy Act if it is an information pertaining to uh, an entity that is not a natural person. Consent must be something that is mechanical and tangible. It must be proven. That is a uh, consent that is required under the Data Privacy Act. You have to prove that you have obtained the consent uh, to, to from a data those subject. So who may wish to have some questions, probably uh, they can send their questions to the uh, Villas' Law Center and we'll try to uh, answer them. Three things, no? we were reminded by the National Privacy Commission that the cardinal rule, if you talk about processing of data information, is that do not collect if you cannot protect. The, the primary impact of the Data Privacy Act, my friends, are the eight rights provided by law. Very important. There are eight rights here. You talk about the right to be informed, the right to access, the right to erasure or blocking, the right to object, the right to rectify. You talk about data portability, the right to file a complaint, and of course, the right to, da to damages. Data is more valuable than money because if someone takes your money, that's all they have, okay? But if you let someone take your data, oh my God, eventually they will take your money too. So does the DPA only cover personal information per se, or does it also cover information about companies, testing results, and... Hey sir, uh, good Hi. evening. Sir, just a question about the DPO offices. Is Ooh. there such a thing as a void or not valid DPO officer appointment, uh, wherein um, even though the NPC has properly recognized his appointment, We will be having our second quiz. Really, just kindly, you know, enter the link in the chat box. Okay, so we can get started. So, I think a little bit of an icebreaker in order. Uh, can we bring out the wheel? Yes, we will do again a raffle. Congratulations! Ronaldin A. Irvon. the verification. General rule, the party must sign the verification. Certification is from shopping, the party must sign. The certification is from shopping, that is the rule. Okay? But if does not fall under the Data Privacy Act if it is an information pertaining to uh, an entity that is not a natural person. Consent must be something integrated in our uh, constitution that you know the state owns all real property and all lands in the Philippines. Okay, derecho. Yung 2020 Rules on Civil Procedure, 
were promulgated by the Supreme Court precisely, my friends, because of the Supreme Court's rulemaking power or the power wow, of probably me. one, actually. So let me begin, my friends. No, so if you will read the, the amendments, actually, if you will study it carefully, you will realize that there are how many areas here? Only nine areas to consider. Okay. What are these? Amendments under the rules on pleadings. Pagkasama-samahin ko na. Rule 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 13. The number 2, amend, uh, rule, uh, amendments, no? Under Rule 10 on amendments. Okay? Uh, important changes introduced to the rules of the amendment under Rule 10. What else? Amendments under the rules on summons. Rule 14. Okay? What else? Amendments under Rule 15 on motions. Amendments, of course, introduced to Rule uh, to Rule 18, pre-trial. Dito, marami po. Ayan. And of course, Rule 30, trial, my friends. Finally, there are amendments also that should be discussed under Rule 33, my friends. Okay.
does not fall under the Data Privacy Act if it is an information pertaining to uh, an entity that is not a natural person. Consent must be something that is mechanical and tangible. It must be proven. That is a uh, consent that is required under the Data Privacy Act. You have to prove that you have obtained the consent uh, to from help a data out those who, who may wish to have some questions. Probably uh, they can send their questions to the uh, Villas' Law Center and will try to uh, answer them. We were reminded by the National Privacy Commission that the cardinal rule, if you talk about processing of data information, is that do not collect if you cannot protect. The, the primary impact of the Data Privacy Act, my friends, are the eight rights provided by law. Very important. There are eight rights here. You talk about the right to be informed, the right to access, the right to erasure or blocking, the right to object, the right to rectify. You talk about data portability, the right to file a complaint, and of course, the right to, da to damages. Data is more valuable than money. Because if someone takes your money, that's all they have. Okay? But if you let someone take your data, oh my God, eventually, they will take your... So does the DPA only cover personal information per se, or does it also cover information about companies' testing results? And hey, sir. Uh, good Hi. evening, sir. Just a question about the DPO offices. Is Ooh. there such a thing as a void or not valid DPO officer appointment, uh, wherein um, even though the NPC has properly recognized his appointment? We will be having our second quiz. Really, just kindly, you know, enter the link in the chat box, okay? So we can get started. So I think a little bit of an icebreaker is in order. Uh, can we bring out the wheel? Yes, we will do again a raffle. Congratulations! Ronaldin A. Irvon. Consent must be something that is mechanical and tangible. It must be proven. That is a uh, consent that is required under the Data Privacy Act. You have to prove that you have obtained the consent uh, to from help a data out those subject. So who may wish to have some questions, probably uh, they can send their questions to the uh, Villas' Law Center and will try to uh, answer them. Three things, no? We were reminded by the National Privacy Commission that the cardinal rule, if you talk about processing of data information, is that do not collect if you cannot protect. The, the primary impact of the Data Privacy Act, my friends, are the eight rights provided by law. Very important. There are eight rights here. You talk about the right to be informed, the right to access, the right to erasure or blocking, the right to object, the right to rectify. You talk about data portability, the right to file a complaint, and of course, the right to, da to damages. Data is more valuable than money because if someone takes your money, that's all they have, okay? But if you let someone take your data, oh my God, eventually they will take your money too. So does the DPA only cover personal information per se or does it also cover information about companies' testing results? Hey, sir. Uh, good Hi. evening. 
Sir, just a question about the DPO offices. Is Ooh. there such a thing as a void or not valid DPO officer appointment, um, wherein um, even though the NPC has properly recognized his appointment? We will be having our second quiz. Just kindly, you know, enter the link in the chat box, okay? So we can get... Good day to our dear attendees from different parts of the country. I pray that you're all in a great state of health. This free webinar is streaming live via the Villales Law Center's YouTube channel and Facebook page. If you can hear my voice clearly, please type in the comment section, hashtag VLC. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Optimize this learning opportunity. Share this free online lecture to your friends and together learn at the comfort of your homes. I want to formally welcome you all to this free webinar. This is part of a series of free online lectures brought to you by the Virtual Law Companion of Villages Law Center. Allow me to share to you this good news. The Virtual Law Companion is the newest innovation of Villages Law Center which aims to provide an easy, convenient, and quality bar review experience. The Virtual Law Companion is a web application that is hosted on a dedicated cloud server. It can be accessed via the internet 24-7 for any web browser, using any device or handheld computers like Android or iOS phones. Meaning, you can study anytime, anywhere, and from any mobile device. Please visit our website at www.biliasislawcenter.com to know more about our programs and activities. Before we formally start, please take note of some reminders. First, this free webinar is pre-recorded to ensure the uninterrupted streaming of lectures. Secondly, VLC team will be with you to assist you should you need more information about our program. Please visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Without further ado, please give your virtual class and welcome our lecturer today. Again, this free webinar is brought to you by our virtual law company. Maraming salamat po. Together, we can make things happen. Together, we can. Our lecturer for today is currently serving as the administrator of the Intramuros Administration, an agency attached to the Philippines Department of Tourism that is responsible for the orderly administration and development of the historic district of Intramuros. Under his term, he is leading the urban regeneration of the old city of Manila through proper conservation planning, culture, arts, heritage, and sustainable tourism initiatives. This effort has led to record increases in visitors' arrivals, income from commercial operations, infrastructure, urban regeneration and planning initiatives, and community stakeholder partnerships. He has also served in various capacities in the Tourism Infrastructure and Enterprise Zone Authority and rose from the rank to eventually being appointed as its Chief Operating Officer, and also served in the Office of the Presidential Advisor for Political Affairs, the Senate of the Republic of the Philippines and the Department of Health as well. A graduate of the University of Santo Tomas, with the following degrees, Master of Laws, with Latin honors cum laude, Bachelor of Laws and Bachelor of Arts, major in literature. He is also a law professor in the Adamson University's College of Law and Bulacan State University's College of Law. He teaches commercial law review, and other subjects related to it as well, and also political law review. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Giller Biacito. Hey everyone. My name is Tilia Racido and welcome to the free online 
lecture series brought to you by the Villiasis Law Center. Um, prepare for the bar examinations at any time, anywhere, and uh, from any mobile device of your choice. Check out the VLC website at www.villiasislawcenter.com for more details and particulars. Optimize this opportunity of learning now. Like the Facebook page and share this FB Live uh, session. Post a watch party and uh, tag your friends as well. Learn more of how you may uh, to, to learn more of, uh, of this uh, session. Um, together, you will learn this all at the comfort of your homes. Before we start, uh, please comment VLC if you um, have you uh, your hearing be clear. Uh, let us start. Allow me to share my screen. So the task given for me today is uh, to give a short discourse on developments of special commercial laws and also to update you on the latest developments pertaining uh, to uh, certain laws uh, related to special commercial laws. Now, for purposes of today's discussion, I would like to outline the discussion into two points. First, I would like to give you for significant developments in legislation that has impact on special commercial laws. Then I will move on to significant developments in jurisprudence and other issuances that you will find useful in your review for the bar examination. Okay, so before we start, kindly let me see in the comment box of the Facebook page. So, in terms of legislation, the significant de development there will be will be the passage of what we refer to as the Personal Property Security Act, and that is basically Republic Act 11057 and the implementing rules and regulations that were subsequently promulgated after the passage of the law. Now, when we speak of Republic Act 11057, uh, let me just give the context that it was signed the law on August 17, 2018, and the implementing rules and regulations were uploaded into the official Gazette last November 2019. So in effect, with the promulgation of the implementing rules and regulations, we are now implementing fully the Personal Property Security Act. Now, the PPSA was passed by Congress basically with one principal objective and that is to promote economic activity by increasing access of micro, small, and medium enterprises by establishing a new, more, more unified and modern legal framework for securing obligations with personal property. So later, I will give to you what the context was prior to the passage of uh, the Personal Property Security Act and what are the significant developments introduced by the PSA. Now, before the Personal Property Security Act was enacted into law by Congress in 2018, what was the situation? For the PPSA, the creation of a valid security interest over personal property in the Philippine law was governed by different laws, principally by the Civil Code and the Chattel Mortgage Law. Now, significantly as well, in terms of uh, what the situation was, with the PPSA passage, 2018 and the implementing rules and regulations in November 2019. Under the PPSA rules, all security interests created from 2019 to the PPSA's full implementation by the registry established and operational, referring to the, the PPSA IRR refers to as the transitional period, will now be governed by the PPSA except that the registration will be in accordance still with the Chattel Mortgage Law until the registry is fully established by the LR Land Registration Authority. And once the registry, the central registry has been established, the creation of a valid security interest over personal property under the Philippine law will now be entirely governed by the PPSA and the PPSA rules. Now, again, what was the situation before the passage of the PPSA? Under all rules, banks and 
other lenders prefer traditional collateral, definitely, such as land, buildings, and other immovable property. Because, basically, the financial institution prefer registered title as well as the property's type, size, and movable nature made it more easier to enforce the security that's the subject of the contractual application. And movable collateral, based on the assessment of the financial institutions, were perceived to be more risky than immovable collateral. And this, of course, definitely made it difficult for micro, small, and medium enterprises to obtain loans from a credible financial institution, since they have no immovable property among their assets. So this was principally one major objective that the PPSA wanted to resolve. Again, to allow micro, small, and medium enterprises to have access to credit facilities being offered by this credit, uh, by these financial institutions. Now, with the PPSA now being in force, okay, it mandated the Land Registration Authority to create a centralized registry where all notice of security interest and means and personal property may be registered. Proper reference may be made Chapter 5 of uh, the PPSA law. Now, aside from that, we said one major objective is to unify, you, to ensure that there is already a uniform set of rules that will apply to security interests and liens over personal property. The expectation, of course, that with the enforcement of all of these uniform rules, people will have more access to facilities being offered by financial institutions. Okay, now I hope you're enjoying so far this webinar. Kindly type DLC in the chat box. That is, uh, you may find the chat box as well. Moving forward, the PPSA also expanded what we refer to as registrable collateral. Under the PPSA now, registrable or collateral, which basically implies this can also be now be subject of security security agreements, include deposit accounts, receiving bonds, checks, and other negotiable instruments, shares of stock, store inventory equipment, livestock, motor vehicles, and in, even intellectual property rights are already included in assets that can be the subject of security agreements between the parties. However, and this is and this is very clear under the provisions of the PPSA. It does not cover aircraft and ships, which are covered by other special laws as well. Now, one significant um, development introduced by the PPSA as well is that it now includes and allows the use of future property as collateral, provided that the security interest is not created and unless the borrower acquires rights in it or the power to recover it, proper reference to that would be Section 5, subparagraph B of the PSA law. Why is this significant? The situation was prior to the PPSA, borrower cannot pledge or mortgage property that he does not own. With the objective of increasing capital access to more micro, small, and medium enterprises, Significantly, the PPSA introduced and made it possible already to allow future youth, future property to be the subject of security contracts and agreements. But you will note later, and I will show to you, that there are significant um, guidelines as well on how future property can be the subject of any security agreement. Now, under the PPSA as well, pledge, chattel, a mortgage of a movable collateral will differ in terms of formalities as to creation, protection, and registration and enforcement. And how does the implementing rules and regulations provide for this context? You have to consider first the type of property in terms of whether it's tangible or intangible. And later, this, we will show you as well the significant guide uh, provisions of the IRR in, in the in conjunction as well with the applicable provision of the uh, of the Republic Act. Okay? So we will make a comparison 
in terms of how this is being enforced in the by in the implementing rules and regulations as well. Now, an example will be in pledge delivery of the thing pledge is necessary. And this is even provided under the CBP for its validity while in shuttle mortgage delivery is not necessary. So again, you will see that there are significant rules already introduced in terms of how security interests may be constituted depending on what type of uh, personal property is involved. Okay, now, while you're watching, please tag a friend or you may have a watch party as well in order for everyone to enjoy this session further. As I was saying a while ago, under the TPSA now, there are specific rules and formalities as to creation, perfection, registration, and enforcement. And these were all simplified and harmonized already. And in implementing rules and regulations, it's clearly provided on how to constitute a security of uh, interest. A signed written contract is enough to create a security interest. But there are formal requirements as well. And these are all provided law itself and in the implementing rules and regulations. Now, under the PPSA and the implementing rules and regulations, there are grounds or there are also guidelines with respect to how we should construe the perfection of that security contract or agreement. And this is consistent as well with the intent and the principal objective set by the law to create a central registry. So that means, and clearly we will show you later as well, that there is a requirement that there must be proper notice to the LRA in terms of how this security interest will be properly enforced. Now, with respect to possession, that is also a requirement in terms of how this will be properly done. But again, this will all depend on what kind of property or personal property is the subject of the security interest. Now, this I, we've already said, okay, that there are already a set of formal requirements in terms of the, uh, ensuring the perfection and enforceability of security interest in movable property. And the enforcement of these uniform rules are basically intended to ensure ease of doing as well the execution and enforcement of the security agreement that the parties will, engage, will be uh, legally be bounded to and will be subsequently enforced as well. Okay? So proper reference in terms of the formalities may be in, uh, referred to in Section 12 of uh, the PPSA. Now, in the passage of the PPSA, there were a number of laws that were amended, modified, okay, in terms of how the PPSA will now be properly, um, uh, properly enforced as well. So let me go through a rundown of the laws that have been subsequently affected with the passage of the PPSA. These laws include the following. They include even presidential decrees that were issued long before, and other issuance of cautions which are deemed to be inconsistent already with the framework set by the PPSA. Okay, so these laws were either repealed, modified, or amended accordingly. So one of them is sections 1 to 16 of Act Number, Commonwealth Act Number 1508, otherwise known as the Shuttle Mortgage Law. So in terms of uh, the shuttle mortgage law, please make reference to the fact that uh, sections 1 to 6 has already been uh, 16. Sections 1 to 16 of uh, Act Number 1508 has been subsequently repealed, amended, or modified due to its consistency already with the, with the Personal Property Security Act. Okay. Articles 2085, 2123, okay. 21. 27, 2140, 
2141, Articles 2241-2243, and including Articles 2246-2247, to has been subsequently affected as well by the Personal Property Security Act. So these, all of these articles are covered by the Civil Code, but it's been subsequently affected with a new rule set by the PPSA and its implementing rules and regulations. So please note particularly and kindly note as well in your code, your codal that you are in possession of, that all of these articles have been subsequently affected already by the Personal Property Security Act. So I hope you are learning so far from this session and do participate actively as well by saying whether by typing DLC to ensure that uh, there's active engagement between us in this conversation. Now, another significant uh, provision of the law that has been subsequently affected is Section 13 of the Public Act Number 5980, okay, or otherwise known as the Financing Company Act of 1980. Okay, so please note. This is significant in your discussions of uh, 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 when you do cover already commercial law review, that this significant uh, portion of the Financing Company Act has been subsequently amended, repealed, or modified accordingly by the Personal Property Security Act. Okay. Now, let me move forward as well, because there are a number of laws basically that were also affected by the passage of the Personal Property Security Act. Now, upper reference as well must be made to sections 114 and 116 of Presidential Number 1529, otherwise known as the Property Registration Decree. All of these provisions under the Property Registration Decree has been subsequently affected as well by the passage of the Personal Property Security Now, other than that, please make reference as well to Section 10 of the same Presidential Decree, and so far as it is considered to be inconsistent with the law already. And finally, Section 5, subparagraph E of uh, the Land Transportation and Traffic Code has been affected as well by the passage of the Personal Property Security Act. Now, in terms of the Personal Property Security Act, we should remember also as well that while the intent is to expand access to uh, credit facilities being offered by financial institutions okay, to micro, small, and medium enterprises, we must remember that there are also limitations in terms of the scope. So what will now be the scope and what will be the limitation of the PPSA? In terms of scope, let us, uh, and this I would like to reiterate, that the PPSA applies to all transactions of any kind that secures an obligation with movable collateral as stated in Section 10. So this is the general rule in terms of its scope and coverage. All transactions of any form that secures an obligation with movable collateral. While this is the general rule, of course, no, there are always exceptions to the general rule. Okay? And what are the exceptions? As, and this I believe I've stated earlier. There are only two exceptions with respect to the scope of the personal property security act. Okay? Interest in aircraft subject to the Public Act 9497, or otherwise known as the Civil Aviation Authority Act of 2008, and ships. Interest in uh, uh, sea vessels or ships subject to Presidential Decree Number 1521 or the Ship Mortgage Decree of 1978. So principally, you have this general rule that all transactions of any form that secures an obligation with movable collateral, collateral is covered. So all transactions. And there are only two exceptions of it. Aircrafts and ships. Okay. While you may ask basically why those two exceptions in terms of the general rule. 
these two exceptions are of course okay, while they may be considered or while they may be covered as by some to be movable collateral these are all subject to other interests as well and these other interests as well and the fact and facts and circumstances are already stated in their corresponding special laws okay so those special laws would be principally the civil aviation authority act of 1978 and the ship mortgage decree of 1978 okay so again note the general rule all transactions of any form it's two exceptions aircrafts and vessels So I hope you're still continuing to learn from this session on uh, special discourse and special commercial laws. Can you type VLC? Thank you. Okay, now, before we move on, I would like to ask uh, everyone in this session now a question. And you may type this in the chat box or provided in the space. Okay. Do you agree? the PPSA will eventually help micro, small, and medium enterprises to have access to credit facilities. Based on the principal summary that I've outlined for you now, do you agree that the Personal Property Security Act will really help micro, small, and medium enterprises have access to credit facilities? So again, you may type your answer in the chat box provided. Moving forward, so the question will be now be how do you create security interests over personal property or provable collateral? These are all stated in Republic Act 101057. And in your screen right now, I have outlined and made a comparison between how do you create security interests, okay, as stated in Section 5. And how it is clearly stated as well in Section 3.01 of the IRR. So, principally, based on uh, Personal Property Security Act, security interest is created by a security agreement. Okay, so the contract that will be basically ex executed by the parties is referred to as a security agreement. Now, and this I've outlined as well, stated a few minutes ago. A security agreement may cover as well future property. Okay. Now, compare this already with, the, with what is provided as well in the screen. And you may refer to Section 3.01 of the IRR. A security interest shall be created by a security agreement or the lease of an operating lease not less than one year. So please note the clarifications as well in terms of how the security interest is created as provided in the implementing rules and regulations as well. Now, please note and the second sentence as well, the implementing rules and regulations with respect to the sale of an account receivable. Okay. Note the quality proviso as well, unless otherwise stipulated by all the parties in the document of the sale. Moving on. Okay. So, second, that particular section discover, uh, discusses for you the coverage of future property. Now, let me move forward in terms of the applicable provisions of the Personal Property Security Act and the implementing rules and regulations on, on future property. Okay. Now, proper reference still is on Section 5 of uh, the law. Okay. But note Section 3.05 of the implementing rules and regulations as shown on your screen. Okay. Here, in terms of the implementing rules and regulations, you may find basically reference to the type of property involved. Okay. Now, please note that these are all outlined in the second and third paragraph of the implementing rules and regulations in reference to tangible asset okay. and including to the extension of the tangible asset as well. Okay. So, Expansion of the implementing rules and regulations was basically meant to was basically contextualized as well to ensure continuity of the security interest over future property. But please note again, okay, in terms of the future property, there is a limitation. 
okay, as provided in section 5 and as provided in section 3.05. Where will you find that limitation? In the law itself, you may find that in subparagraph B. Okay? In the IRR, you will see that in the first paragraph of section 3.05. Okay? The Guan grantor, okay? the security interest in the property is created only when the grantor acquires its right or the power to incorporate. Now, that means while you may agree on future property, it is subject to those general guidelines as well. Okay? So if it does not qualify with respect to the guidelines, then the security interest over the future property cannot be considered as valid. Now, as we said, there is a formal requirement already in terms of how do you now create the security interest over movable collateral, okay? And that document, which I said a while ago, is referred to as the security interest. And if you will read section six of the Republic Act in terms of the formal requirements, okay, proper reference in the IRR can be made also to section 3.03 as with respect to the form. Now, what is the importance of the form? Okay. The importance of the forms comes in the fact that there is a notice requirement to be registered with the, in the central registry being maintained by the LRA. So form is an essential requirement in terms of the validity of the security of the form. Now, in reference to section 3.03, May I draw your attention to the second sentence of the first paragraph? It may consist of one okay, or more writings that taken together establish the intent of the parties. Okay? So there may be several, several security agreements constituted over okay, the property that is the subject of the agreement between the parties. But then again, in terms of its consideration, it can be taken together. And may I draw your attention again to the first sentence of section 3.03 of the R. Okay? It is a written contract and it must be able to identify the collateral of the secured obligation. Why? Again, please remember the fact that there is a requirement of notice and there is a requirement of registration in the central registry. Okay? Now, what is the language? Even the language was already considered as well in terms of the second paragraph of section 6 and the second paragraph of section 3.0. Okay? It shall have that it may be in a language agreed to by the parties as well. But the grantor shall have the right option to have the agreement in notices. So again, this is to facilitate and ensure that there is proper consent made by the parties in the execution of that security contract already. Okay? Now, how should the property be described? Because in earlier, in our um, earlier discussion, again, you will, you will notice that there is a requirement under the IRR on the description of the property. So what or how should the property be described based on the law? Okay. So again, note the applicable provision of section 7 and the reference there too. You may also uh, consider, you should consider section 3.04 with respect to the description of the collateral. So how should it be described? It should be considered sufficient if it reasonably identifies the collateral. And a specific description of the property as collateral is not required in constituting the security interest. Okay, so note the last sentence of the IRR, section 3.04. A description such as all personal property, all equipment, all inventory, or all personal property within that generic category okay, shall already be considered sufficient. Okay, so description, while required, okay, there are considered to be general considerations as well on how that description should be done. Okay, so 
a general description is allowed based on the requirement of the form. Okay, so I have a friend or host uh, watch party while uh, watching this video. Uh, video. Okay, now, since the Personal Property Security Act expanded the mobile collateral to include deposits okay, as well and other personal property, there may be a situation that there may be commingling of funds and money. So that recognition of that fact was properly acknowledged when the PSA law was adopted. So please note, there are specific rules on the rights to proceeds and coming of funds as well. And one of that principal consideration is stated in paragraph, uh, subparagraph A of section 8 of the law. A security interest in personal property shall extend to its identifiable or traceable properties. Okay, so traceable proceeds of the properties is covered by the security interest as well. Now, why is that being done? And that again is consistent with the general principle that it must ensure continuity of security interest. Okay? So in terms of how that continuity shall be enforced, note the provisions of section nine no? and sections 3.02 of the implementing rules and regulations as reflected on your screen right now. Okay? And proper note, proper reference as well must be made to section 21 in terms of a rather uh, what has been referred to as transferee exceptions on the, on the principle that you should ensure continuity of the security interest. Now, as in any security agreement, we've identified the scope, we've identified exceptions to that scope. There are also limitations on the creation of security interests. Right? But those limitations are considered to be contractual limitations as well. Okay? So in terms of what would be the contractual limitations shown on your screen right now are the pertinent provisions of the law and the IRR. Okay? So the uh, it will all depend, basically. Okay? Consider um, Section 10 of the Public Act 110557. Proper reference still will be made in terms of what is the property involved. Okay? So in subparagraph A of Section 10, you will see here the uh, reference to an account receivable. Okay? So please consider those particular provisions respect to any question if there are limitations on the creation of security interests over mobile world. Okay. Now, a security contract is a, a security agreement is considered to be a contract. So there must be consent, object, and consideration. Now, when will you consider that contract to be perfected already? Okay. There are specific rules as well set by the law and set by the IRR. So please note in terms of being asked a question on when will the security contract or agreement executed by the parties be considered already as perfected. Okay. Subparagraph A of section 11 provides that the security interest shall be perfected when it has been created and the secured creditor has taken one of the actions in accordance with the of section 10. Now, subparagraph B is consistent with the first paragraph of section 12.01. It becomes effective against third parties. Okay? So, on perfection, the principal effect okay, will it, it will not just bind the parties, but it will already be considered as effective as well against third parties. Okay. Now, with perfection, with the rules on perfection clearly stated, what will now be the means of perfection? 
the means of perfection will be basically principally based on what is the type of prop or property or asset involved. Okay? So please consider the type of property because the type of property, there are different rules with respect to how perfection should be construed as uh, done. Okay? So please note, while it is not clearly stated in section 12, with respect to how these properties are considered or the means of its perfection, proper reference is well. And I will need reference and clearly this is stated in the IRR on the different types of property involved as well. So please consider first the means of the question of means of perfection. Please consider this and ask yourself what is the property in, or asset involved? Is it tangible or intangible? Or you consider the means of its perfection. Please go back to section 12 and I've outlined as well for you the 2019 applicable provisions of the IR with respect to the different kinds of assets involved in the perfection of its security. All right. Now, another aspect of the control uh, or the means of perfection of the security act contract is the section 13 the means of control okay and this again will involve a determination of what is the property okay so please consider some paragraph a here as an example of section 13 a security interest in a deposit account or investment property may be perfected by control two the actual creation of a security and pay interest in favor of the deposit making institution or the conclusion of the control agreement, okay? okay? So again, with respect to perfection, please consider the type of property involved. Now, the law also recognizes that there can be changes in terms of the means of perfection, okay? Note section 15 and 16 in terms of how this will be done and how should, what are the requirements as well. Now, in terms of the IRR, proper reference as well can be made to sections 4.08 and 4.09. Okay? So, there can be changes okay, in the means of perfection that is allowed by law. But given that allowance given already as well, please consider that there are also limitations and requirements in terms of the changes to be made in the security perfection of the security. Okay, now, um, remember the requirement of uh, notice and the requirement of uh, registry, uh, registration of the central registry. These are all meant basically to ensure that there is priority in the security interest as well. Okay, now please note section 17. There are specific rules in terms of the uh, priority in the security interest. Okay, so it's basically based according to time and uh, on registration for notice or perfection, okay? So it's basically who registers first. And priority shall be determined based on that. Okay? So it is not with regards to order of creation to determine priority, okay? It is with respect to the registration and notice requirement Okay, so I, this again um, is an illustration. So again, with the description of the collateral in section seven, okay, there can be a general description of the collateral as amply stated as well in, in section 3.04 of the implementing rules and uh, regulations adopted in November 2009. Okay, so if you have any reaction that you would like to press, you, you may leave it in the comment page of uh, this page as well. Okay, as so we've covered already. And uh, before we move forward to the other significant uh, uh, laws covered by this discourse, let me ask a question. 
this you may type in your comment, the comment page, the comment uh, part of the page. Okay. Let me ask a question. Okay. What are your significant learnings so far about the personal properties of the app and its implementing rules and regulations? So again, given what we've stated, given what we've discussed in this conversation, okay, what do you consider to be your significant learnings about the personal properties of UPA and the coverage under the implementing rules and regulations? So you may type your comment and your response to the question okay, in the chat box of the page. Okay. So I hope you're learning as well. Please uh, just type PLC in the comment page. Now, let me move forward okay, to a summary of our jurisprudence and other issuances and special commercial laws that you may properly consider as well in your review. So in terms of the summary, I will not be going already to the main uh, uh, provisions of the following special commercial laws. What I, what I did basically is to highlight what, are deemed, what I deem to be significant okay, in terms of the development on uh, uh, laws like the foreign investment law, okay, insolvency laws, particularly on the financial rehabilitation and insolvency act. Okay. And then I will also consider as well a significant matter pertaining to the Philippine population. And it's how and how reviews and mergers and acquisitions are actually being done okay? and what are the remedies of the Philippine Competition Commission in terms of uh, enforcement of uh, the competition law and its implementing rules and regulations as well. Now, um, for the past bar exams, there have been questions raised uh, covering the foreign investments. So the usual questions with respect to the Foreign Investments Act, that who are considered to be doing business in the Philippines? Now, there may be questions as well with respect to the negative list, which we all know to be uh, the two lists under the foreign that uh, aspect. Okay? There's the negative list A and there's the negative list B. Okay? Now, a basic principle, however, in terms of understanding the foreign investment law is asking ourselves why was it passed okay. what is the nature of the foreign investment law? so that question has been answered in the case of the heirs of Winston Gamboa versus Margarito Tevez okay, 2012 where the Supreme Court noted that the foreign investments act is the basic law governing foreign investments in the Philippines now the Supreme Court also said that given that it is the basic law it is irrespective of the nature of business and the area of investment. Okay? So the procedures are also spelled out in the Foreign Investment Act. But proper reference, and this we will know as well, okay, depending on the type uh, of business and also where do, did they establish their business. Okay? Now, the Foreign Investment Act, like its earlier predecessor, statutorily clearly defines as well uh, for us who is a Filipino. Now, this is important, okay, because aside from the requirements under the Corporation Code, okay, there is a nationality requirement as well under the Foreign Investment Act. And the nationality requirement is important to determine whether or not this particular individual or a corporate entity can legally engage in the you know, doing business in the Philippines as well. Okay, so that national entity requirement is already clearly, clearly stated as well under and required under the Constitution. Okay? In the Foreign Investment Act as well, considered already the constitutional framework on the nationality. Now, 
usual questions respect to the Foreign Investments Act will be on the matter pertaining to the business. Now, the classic case in reference to answer this question, of course, will be the steel case case as promulgated by the Supreme Court in 2012. So the steel case, okay, the steel case uh, jurisprudence is thus defined for us doing business in the Philippines in the context of the Foreign Investments Act. The Supreme Court also in that same Covered the discussion on who are not considered doing business in the Philippines. Okay. So please remember this is very important jurisprudence in terms of answering the question on who are considered to be doing business in the Philippines. There is a quite an there are in, there is already an enumeration made by made by the Supreme Court with respect to answering this question. Okay. Now Still case case basically pointed out as well for us that the appointment of a distributor in the Philippines is not sufficient to constitute doing business. Now why is the importance of doing business necessary in terms of determining whether or not the uh, applicable provisions of the Foreign Investments Act can be invoked for tax purposes as well. Okay? Now please note as well that while the appointment of the distributor is considered not to be sufficient is not sufficient to constitute determination of whether you are doing business. Okay. Supreme Court also said in that same case, okay, it can, um, if the distributor is an independent entity which buys and distributes products rather than those other than those of the foreign corporation or in its own name and for its own account, then it can not be considered to be doing business in the Philippines still. So the Supreme Court as well in that case made a uh, ruling that the factual determination on whether or not this uh, establishment is considered to be doing business shall be on a uh, case to case basis or based on the attendant circumstances of the case as well. Okay, now. One important rule with respect to doing business is the case promulgated uh, the Nente was just this one in, in the case of Commissioner versus of Commissioner of Internal Revenue versus JP Morgan Chase Bank. Okay. Just this one in, in that 2018 case said that PESA granted incentives shall only apply to registered operations of the Echo Zone Enterprise and only during its registration with PESA. So clearly this is a limitation on the availment of the incentives by the foreign investor. Okay, so again, the incentives shall apply only to the registered operations of the Echo Zone Enterprise and only during its registration. Losing these qualifications means it cannot anymore avail of the incentives provided under the PESA law okay, and in, in the reference as well to the Foreign Investments Act. Okay, so what happened in this case? The Supreme Court said that the act of leasing the physical plant space, infrastructure, and other transmission facilities of a PESA registered export enterprise is not covered within the registered activities. Okay, therefore, the income derived from that, uh, those activities shall be subject to the proper tax as well. Okay, so again, remember the case from uh, where the ponente was justice done in, in terms of the limitation and availment of these incentives. Okay, it's issued in November 2000. Okay, now let me move forward now to the financial rehabilitation and insolvency. So um, before I move forward, I hope you're still uh, watching this and continuing to learn from our discussions. Please type VLC in terms of uh, asking ourselves and knowing from our end okay, if you're enjoying and learning from this session as well. So let me move forward to the, uh, uh, the free yellow. Okay? Note the 2019 of last survey. Developing corporation versus Venacita properties. Okay, 
where the Supreme Court defined again for us rehabilitation. Because remember, okay, rehabilitation under the free law is not the same as uh, rehabilitation under the old insolvency and bankruptcy laws of Ireland. And the Supreme Court, in the case of La Savoie, defined for us rehabilitation in the context of free law. So how did the Supreme Court define for us uh, rehabilitation? Okay. Rehabilitation was defined as the restora restoration of a debtor to a condition of successful operation in insolvency. If it is shown that its continuance of operation is economically feasible and the creditors can recover by way of present value payments projected in the plan. Okay? So rehabilitation should be understood in the context of ensuring, again, being able to go back to a successful operation in order for the uh, rehabilitation, uh, the establishment undergoing rehabilitation to be able to pay back its creditors, okay? So it's not closure. Rehabilitation is in the context of the restoration of the debtor to condition of successful operation and solvency, okay? Now, corporate rehabilitation as well was defined in that same case. Corporate rehabilitation is defined by the Supreme Court is an effort to restore and reinstate the corporation to its former position of successful operation and insolvency. And solvency, sorry. So again, the context is to ensure that the corporation will be able to go back to paying its creditors as well. So context of rehabilitation is restoration to successful operation and solvency. Now, oh. with the current public health situation right now, there are a number of companies that are being closed. But principal remedies are also provided by the Financial Rehabilitation and Insolvency Act to address these concerns. Okay? So it can be basically um, done in court or outside of court by the parties. But again, okay, FRIA encourages parties, individuals, corporations to Okay, avail of the remedies provided therein to undergo rehabilitation. Okay. Now, note the limitation as well that the FIA will not be applicable to banks or quasi banks, insurance companies, and PNE companies because they are all governed under special laws with respect to their uh, uh, rehabilitation as well. Okay. So, again, there are Three principal modes of rehabilitation. You have courts of device, you have uh, pre negotiated rehabilitation, and throughout a court or informal proceedings. Now, with respect to courts of device, okay, what is important there is the determination of when the commencement of order was issued. So, in terms of determination of the commencement of order, the value of the commencement of order, and when the rehabilitation proceedings should actually be considered as having started with the issuance of the commencement of order. Please refer to sections 15 and 16 of the free law. Now, um, I outlined significant portions, and this is shown on the your screen. Section 16, with respect to uh, the contents of the commencement order. Please remember this con the contents of the uh, commencement order because this established basically the substantial requirements on how should be in the commencement order that would ensure rehabilitation of uh, the uh, entity involved. Okay. Now, pre-negotiated rehabilitation, as the term implies, okay, can be done by the debtor, by himself, or jointly with creditors. There is a specific threshold requirement in terms of the creditors. So please note the two-thirds uh, requirement in terms of the total liabilities of the debtor, so two thirds of the universe, okay, and you make a need to make a distinction based on those uh, creditors, whether they are secured creditors or they are unsecured creditors as well, okay, because there is a different threshold. While it's 50 50 percent, the base of determining that 50 percent is on uh, the declarations made as well by the creditor on who are his debtors, okay? 
the out of court settlement is basically here as well, court assistance in order to achieve the objectives of rehabilitation. And there are minimum requirements set by law as well, with respect to how this remedy can be exercised. So, shown on your screen right now are the distinctions of the different remedies. Okay, so note as well the threshold requirements required under the law. Okay, I hope you are still continuing to learn from this session and you may type your comments below in the chat box as well. Now, um, before we move forward to the last uh, particular special law that I would be discussing, I would like to pose this question again. And you may type this in the chat box. Okay. Given today's public health situation and economic crisis, knowing what you all have already regarding financial and rehabilitation, would you advise businesses to avail of the remedy still under the PLA? Okay. So you may type share with us your answer to this question in the chat box. Now let me move forward to the last law that I will be discussing. Okay. This is with respect to the Philippine competition law. Let me provide first the context of uh, the competition law. It is considered to be the antitrust law of the Philippines. Prior to the enactment of uh, Republic of 1067, there is legally no Trust, antitrust law. Now, with the passage of the competition law, okay, the Philippine, there was a creation of the Philippine Competition Commission, which will review merger decisions of the parties. Okay, and aside from that mandate, there are also considerations with respect to ensuring the objective that the market remains to be competitive and open to everyone, and that it is considered to be a violation of antitrust law should you fail to do so. Now, this is again a short uh, statement on what is the objective of the competition uh, law. This is basically meant to ensure the well-being of consumers and to preserve the efficiency of competition in the marketplace. Okay, so these are this is basically the principal objectives of the competition law and those objectives are clearly stated in the whole reading of the law itself. Now, I would like to talk about the in, uh, interim measure, measures order being issued by the Philippine Competition Commission. What is the value of this uh, interim measures order? Okay. The interim measures order basically says that why we are reviewing your merger and acquisition, okay? you must exercise or do these interim measures as well already, okay? Why? Because the Philippine competition may later on make a declaration that there is a violation of the uh, rules and merger and acquisition, or that this particular agreement signed by the parties is really anti, violates the antitrust law, okay? Now, the interim measures order Okay. The interim measures order okay, are basically meant to ensure as well that uh, there will be no violation of the competition law and that uh, you are prohibited as well from consummating the agreement until after the commission has already given its clearance to the proposed merger or acquisition. Okay. Now, the interim measures order Proper legal basis is section 12, subparagraph F. Okay. So the interim measures order can include not just the imposition of fines, but also interim orders and as, uh, such as a show cause and um, order and cease and desist issued against the private uh, person. Okay. This is also consistent with the PCC rules on merger procedures, so particular reference to the implementing rules and regulations is section 2.13, subparagraph G. Okay, so what is this import, uh, important? Because you may be liable for fines for violation of this uh, 
requirements. Okay? So section 29 of paragraph B lays the basis already for the imposition of uh, fines. Okay? Now, let me talk about a particular case. Okay? That would um, allow for the issuance, that allow, basically allow the PCC to issue the uh, issue the, the, the uh, interim measures order. Okay. And this was clearly amplified in the case of Uber and Grab. Okay. Both are public utility companies, okay. but issues have been raised against them as well. When this proposal uh, okay, was first considered by the Philippine Competition Commission, the question was, can their merger or acquisition okay, amount to no competition to the marketplace? Okay? So can there be a monopoly already 